All right, we're, we're 1202. So I, I guess we will officially get started. So welcome everybody to today's SB Grid webinar series. I uh, hope everybody's doing well in their various remote work locations, or if, if you're starting to shift back, you're shifting back safely. Um, just to, a couple things to mention. So if, if you are working from home uninspectedly and you'd like to set up the SB Grid installer, you're probably aware of it, but you can register for it at the URL on the slide there. And we have a, a webinar that Jason did about it last week that should be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, today's webinar is part of a series replacing what was going to be an in-person symposium in Boston. If you have suggestions for interesting stories or presentations, either one that you'd like to present, or if you know a colleague or a coworker who has a scientifically interesting story, please feel free to let us know. Um, always, we're always looking for interesting things to talk about scientifically. Uh, on the technical side, so the, the audience should be muted. And if you have questions, you can either use the, the raise your hand signal to indicate you have a question and we can unmute you for direct chat, or you, you can use the, the Zoom chat to pass questions to any of the hosts during, during the webinar and we'll pass those on. Uh, so for upcoming webinars, this, this Friday, we've got Ellen Zong, who's the developer of Cryo DRGN, which is a machine learning application for discovering Structure, patterns of structural heterogeneity in cryo-EM data. And next Tuesday, we have another round of training presentations. So today, I'm happy to introduce Kelly Brock and Thomas Hopp from Deborah Marks Lab at HMS. Uh, they're here today to tell us about EV couplings, which is a software library for predicting 3D structures from sequence alignments, which is a very useful tool for various areas of experimental structural biology, particularly low resolution map fittings such as low resolution crystallography or cryo -EM. So with that, I'm happy to turn it. Oh, one more thing. We are, we are recording this. It will be up on, the, on YouTube in a day or two. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Kelly and Thomas. So thank you for joining us and thank you for substituting on such short notice. So welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, I wanted to just say thank you to SB Grid for having us here at this webinar today. So hi everybody, my name is Kelly Brock. I am a postdoc in Deborah Marx's lab. Uh, I'm here today with Thomas Hopp. Who, Thomas, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Thomas. Um, I started developing the application we're presenting today um, during my postdoc in Debbie Marx's lab. Um, and now carrying on the work as a scientific consultant remotely. And yeah, looking forward to showing this piece of software to you together with Tell Kelly today. Great. All right, so today we want to talk a little bit about the pipeline that Thomas is the architect of EV couplings. So the first question is, what exactly is EV couplings and what can it be used for? The answer is that evolutionary couplings, or as we're going to refer to it, EV couplings, is actually a pipeline that enables us to use a protein or an RNA, any kind of sequences, evolutionary history, to answer many different biologically relevant questions. So some of the questions that we've been able to tackle with this piece of software, with this framework, is we can actually predict things like 3D protein structure de novo. We can predict interactions, functional sites, how proteins are actually changing in functionally relevant ways, as well as getting structures for things like say RNA. We also can use the exact same mathematical underpinning to be able to predict any possible mutation effect that you might want to see. And just to prove that this pipeline does work, Here's sort of one of the earlier examples where we took just the sequence information alone, we built an alignment against it and applied our framework to it, and we were actually able to get a predicted structure for several, actually many different proteins. So we're showing two proteins here, and these are the actual de novo structures that we predicted using just the sequence information. Now, we predicted these structures a few years before there were actually crystal structures determined for them. The nice thing is that when 
experimentalists were able to actually get the structures, they matched very closely to our predictions with TM scores that indicated the same overall fold. We also had another nice example of where we made a prediction two years before a crystal structure actually showed what the interaction between two proteins was. In this case, we're looking at two proteins that are linked to antibiotic resistance, ROD A and PBP2. Now, we knew that these two proteins interacted, but we didn't really know how. So first of all, we helped our collaborators in Andrew Cruz's lab actually get the crystal structure by providing a de novo folded model that they were able to use for molecular replacement. So that's one nice thing is that we were able to just get a monomer structure for one of these proteins, this one, in this paper. However, what we were also able to do was we made a very strong prediction that the transmembrane part of one of the proteins would contact two transmembrane helices in its partner protein in a very specific way. Now, these predictions were very strong, and just recently, aka two years later from when we first made this prediction, they were actually able to get the full crystal structure of the complex. And indeed, uh, the, that tr the transmembrane helices of the two different proteins interacted exactly how we predicted. So this was a nice thumbs up to show that yes, uh, this pipeline, this framework, EV couplings, can give useful and meaningful predictions that turn out to be very true. One other thing I would like to point out is that our predictions can go beyond just one single structure. So for example, this is a protein called Merge, which is a flipase in the membrane. And we had kind of thought that it adopts open and closed conformations. So as part of its function, it's actually able to adopt at least two separate structures that are quite different from each other. Now, the nice thing about EV couplings is that it actually provides support for both structures. So not only were we able to say that, yes, our predictions are showing at least two separate structures, but we were also able to show exactly how uh, this structure was opening and closing to form two separate 3D folds. Finally, I also wanted to mention some of the interesting work that's come out of the mutation effect predictions for this pipeline. So what we're going to be talking about here is a protein called APOE, which is a very, which basically this particular gene incorporates a particular risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. In particular, there are two kind of very common isoforms in the human population. One of these mutations, effectively, makes you much less susceptible to Alzheimer's disease in old age, while the other mutation actually says that you're about 15, up to 15 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. The first thing I want to point out is that we are able to get mutation effect predictions for basically any mutation that you might want to make that's not GAPS. We have a separate software that can deal with insertions and deletions. But that's why what we're looking at here basically looks like a deep mutational scan because we are able to make predictions for every possible change of amino acid that you might want to make. So we developed this mutation effect prediction model for APOE. And what we found is that the two isoforms that we're looking at in the population, E2 and E4, we're actually on completely opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of our mutation predictions. And keep in mind that these also have completely opposite phenotypes with regards to Alzheimer's disease risk. So we were actually able to not only make predictions, but our predictions are borne out with what we know about human variation in this particular protein sequence. Now, just kind of take a step back, I've talked a lot about why we think EV couplings works very well in a variety of contexts, but the question still remains, how exactly does EV couplings work? So the answer is that we use what's called a global probability model to identify residues that are covariating in a certain pattern that's consistent with 3D structure. So for example, let's say we start with a query sequence here. 
Now we can build what's called a multiple sequence alignment by finding related sequences, not only for say our human query, but what that particular sequence looks like in pigs, in dogs, chickens, fish, all the way down. Now, once we've built this large, what we call a sequence alignment, what we can actually do is say, let's, we're very, very interested in this particular residue. And we'll say it's at the ith position. Now we see that sometimes it's an A in related sequences, and sometimes it changes to a glycine. Now the question that becomes, when you actually translate into three-dimensional space, into the fold of this protein, what is residue I actually in contact with? Now, let's say that we look at all other possible positions at the same time in a global probability model. And let's say that we notice that residue J, whenever I changes, J changes as well. So this is what we mean by covariation. So there was, there's a whole body of work that's looked at this idea going back decades, but sort of the key scientific principle is that there's a lot of um, sort of confounding factors that go into this, where let's say you have three things that are all covariant together. How do you know which of them are actually in contact? The global probability model is what's actually able to help discern some of those answers. But this is the basic idea underlying it. Now, the idea is that if you have two residues I and J that are co-varying according to our global probability model in a way that is consistent with them being in three-dimensional contact, then that means we can get what's called the predicted contact map. So that's what we're looking at on the left-hand side. So what we're looking at here is both axes are positioned in sequence. And we're putting a dot where we predict that there's a very strong coupling between those two residue positions. Essentially, this is a way of mapping a three-dimensional structure into a two-dimensional space. So on the left are our predictions. Now on the right, this comes from taking an actual crystal structure, for example, and saying, okay, we think we see in this particular experimentally determined structure, we see that we have two residues that are indeed in contact with each other. They're very close to each other. We're going to put a dot there. So we have predictions on the left, experiment on the right. What happens when we overlay them? As you might guess by the fact that we're giving this talk right now, indeed they overlay very well with each other. Our predictions are matching experimental structure very well. Thomas, would you like to take it up? So now that Kelly's told you about um, the, the basic science and um, what applications this has already turned out to be useful for, I'll walk you through the technical details of our software and um, how to run it, um, how the outputs look like. And I will start off with uh, a brief overview um, of how the computation is carried out by this piece of software called EV Couplings. Um, because the computational pipeline that underlies the software is a multi-step process. And um, the first step, which is one of the key steps of the method, is to create a good sequence alignment. Um, from the sequence alignment, then uh, we identify evolutionary couplings by inferring the global probability model. And um, that's kind of the raw material that we then use to derive all the other predictions um, that one might be interested in such as predicting three-dimensional structures by using these ECs to derive distance restraints. Um, we use um, CNS to um, make our structure predictions, but you could also put that into other software like uh, Rosetta. Um, we also use this probability model um, to predict mutation effects um, or to predict protein-protein interactions. And um, then in the end, this uh, application also offers you the possibility to make comparisons between the predictions that you made and um, uh, ground truth, such as experimental structures, to see if the predicted um, couplings are indeed close in 3D or uh, whether the um, folded 3D structural models agree with um, known experimental structures. Um, this whole piece of software is written in Python. Um, it's uh, available at the uh, GitHub repository put on the slide. It's the application itself um, 
is in SV Grid, which um, simplifies installation because there is a lot of external tools that this pipeline makes use of for creating alignments and structure predictions. Um, but um, I should, and that's the reason why uh, we put this here as a link, I should mention, besides being an application, this is also a Python package um, that's very useful for the, um, different computational biology tasks, such as dealing with sequence alignment, evolutionary couplings, um, identifying homologous 3D structures, and so on. So if you're um, writing software yourself, um, this also might be worth a look at uh, for, for developing other workflows or tools. Okay, but um, now without further ado to uh, how to actually run EV couplings and uh, for that you have two possibilities. Um, the one possibility that's uh, outlined here on the right is as a standalone application through SB Grid, um, which is particularly useful if you want to predict large numbers of proteins um, or um, just automate the process. We have a second way of running the application, which is through a web application, um, which you see on the left-hand side, um, which is available at evcouplings.org. And we also have a new better version of a, a redeveloped version um, that will be made available to the public very soon. As part of this presentation, you already get the uh, early access link, so you can try this out yourself if you're interested. Um, so depending on your use case, if you've never Dealt with, dealt with this type of analysis before, it might be a good idea to maybe start off with a web server and then for running larger amounts of jobs um, to switch to the command line application. But uh, whatever suits people best, I think is the right choice. Um, okay, so uh, now how to actually run EV couplings. Um, no matter if you run this on the web server or through SP Grid as a standalone application, um, you're gonna specify some parameters. Uh, if you run this through SV Grid, um, you have to specify a configuration that defines all the param parameters of the job. And um, the way this fundamentally works is through a configuration file that outlines all the settings. Um, so um, it also forces you to transparently store the job that you've run. And so you'll be able to, to uh, trace back what you did um, at a later stage. Um, and I'll walk through what the most important settings are on, on the following slides. If you need some help uh, on the most important parameters, you can just run EV couplings dash dash help and uh, you will get a summary of the most important parameters. Okay, so um, the most important part of course is for this uh, to select the protein that you're interested in. Um, the pipeline and the application is mostly centered around Uniprot identifiers. Um, so in the simplest use case, you would just select a Uniprot ID. Uh, on the web server, you put that into the input text field. On the um, command line application, um, you can either put that Uniprot ID directly in the config file or a second way we offer to simplify running things is you have a base config file and then you add some command line parameters and that allow you to override the most important parameters so you can quickly start your job. So on the command line application, what you would say is EV couplings minus P and then put the Uniprot uh, ID of the protein that you're interested in. Um, if your sequence is not a Uniprot entry, um, then you can also input, at least for the command line application, um, a custom sequence using the minus S flag, uh, which points to a fast A file that contains your query sequence. On the web server, you can just put the se uh, actual sequence into the input box. Um, and now I'm taking a small step back uh, again to the, to the fundamentals of the method. The most critical part for, for this method to work is getting a good sequence alignment. Um, the ass assumption that underlies the method is um, that you need a set of sequences that ha are conserved with regard to the property of interest that you are looking in. So they must be isofunctional. If you're interested in 3D structure, they should all be isostructural sequences. Uh, of course, if you don't know what the structures of these sequences are, for example, then you have to find some proxy of identifying sequences which you think are likely um, to, for example, have the same structure. Um, 
So one critical part, um, Kelly, could we just briefly jump back to the previous slide? Thank you. Um, the, the first critical part is selecting which region of the input sequence you're uh, interested in. Are you, this is particularly relevant if you're looking at a multi-domain protein. Uh, whether you're interested in just a particular domain or a su subset of domains or whether you're interested in the entire protein sequence. Um, this also has uh, technical implications um, for generating the sequence alignment. Current sequence alignment programs have the um, property that they tend to run away, if we're not careful, um, on uh, domains that have lots of sequences and that are very uh, evolutionarily diverged. So um, this is a parameter. There is no right answer in the beginning. That's something you have to try, identify what region you're interested. And if you don't get the results that you want, explore with different regions and, and different domain arrangements um, to look at. On the web server, you can uh, look at this graphically and adjust the region with a slider. If you start the job using the command line application, you would um, supply the parameter minus R and then um, put the first and the last residue of the region that you want to create a sequence alignment and calculate evolutionary couplings for. And a good, a good indication what parts to choose are the PFAM domains in that sequence um, that you get displayed on the web server. Okay. Um, the second part that's really important um, for creating a good sequence alignment is to select how far out you want to go in sequence space. So um, how divergent should the sequences that you, um, that you fetch, how divergent can they be or how divergent should they be, uh, which um, is equivalent to choosing a good E-value or bit score cutoff um, for the sequences that you want to include in the alignment. Um, so we tend to use bit score thresholds because they really measure sequence divergence rather than um, just giving you a statistical expectation value like, um, like the E-value. Um, but the pipeline offers both, both options depending on what, what you prefer. Um, and again, there is no clear right value uh, in many cases. So there are protein families that are very divergent and you may just want to include um, closer sequences or there are sequence families where you want to go really far out. Um, this is also something one has to explore for the protein of interest and the way EV couplings does this is by just running a bunch of sequence alignments with um, progressively more inclusive thresholds. Um, so for instance, here on the web server uh, parameter page, you will see um, three or four bit score thresholds from 0.1 to 0.7, which covers a broad range of how inclusive you want to be um, for your sequences. Um, if you do this on the, on the pipeline, you would just specify the minus B parameter and then give a list um, in quotes of different bit scores um, separated either by a comma or a space. And then the pipeline uh, will just be run for all of these alignment thresholds. And what you'll get is one set of results for each of the alignments. So in effectively, what this does with the current settings that are displayed here, you will get four sets of results. And then you can, um, which we will get to in a second, choose um, the results that you think are the most suitable for your use case. There's a few other parameters that have an influence, but they are not as important as selecting the, the sequence depth. The one is how many search iterations you want to run for your multiple sequence alignment, um, which is the minus n parameter on the, on the pipeline, which would, for example, be minus n5. Um, unless your sequence alignment um, really explodes and you just start picking up too many sequences, Leaving this as five at five is uh, usually uh, a robust, uh, robust selection. Um, the other parameter that you can choose is um, which sequence database to use. Um, for regular monomer structure predictions, we tend to use UniRef90, which is a clustered version of uh, UniProt plus um, other sequences added on top, and they're clustered at a ninety percent sequence. Um, identity cutoff, which speeds up the alignment generation and EC calculation process. Uh, if you're interested, let's say in viral proteins, um, where the sequences aren't as divergent, then uh, you should select a different database such as UniRef 100 
or uni, uniprot, or you can also in, input any other FASTA file as your uh, sequence database. But typically Uniref90 is a good starting point. And on the application, you can set this using minus D and then the name of the database. And then the actual databases are specified in the config file uh, where you have an entry of, uh, of all the available databases with a short name and then the path pointing to the fast, fast A file that contains the sequences. Um, there's a few other um, parameters for modulating how the sequence alignment is, uh, is, is um, post-processed after the homologous sequences have been identified. Um, these aren't as important as selecting the right region and uh, the right alignment depth as presented on the previous slides, but nevertheless, they can help you um, shape a better sequence alignment if necessary. Um, so the first setting um, is called the position filter on the um, pipeline. This is the minus M parameter, and then you would uh, put a percentage as an integer is in the sequence alignment. It determines which columns to include in the final EC probability model. Typically, positions with too many gaps can give spurious correlations and false positive signals. So one typically wants to exclude these. And, um, but it's always a question how conservative you want to be. If you're less conservative, you could set this to 30 or 50. If you want to be quite conservative, um, you would set this, for example, to 70 and then filter positions that have too many, too many gaps in the alignment. Um, conversely, um, the next parameter, minus F, allows you to uh, exclude sequences. Now we're not talking about positions in the alignment, but about entire sequences. Um, if, for instance, the sequence database, just um, you just identified a fragment that only aligns over a certain subregion of the target, but not the entire target, this gives you the opportunity to exclude those um, shorter fragments from the alignment. Uh, again, if you want to be conservative, you would set this, for example, to 70. If you want to be less conservative, you would set this to, let's say, 50%. Um, then the second, uh, the, the third and the fourth parameter allow you to deal with redundancy in the alignment. Again, for your regular run, you can leave this at the defaults. Um, the first one, which is removing similar sequences, um, allows you to just remove highly similar sequences entirely by clustering from the sequence alignment. Um, if you already used Uniref 90, let's say, which is pre-clustered, you don't have to do this. Um, the last parameter here allows you to downweight similar sequences. So if you have strong biases in your uh, sequence database because uh, hundreds of strains of the same bacterium have been sequenced over and over, and you have the same protein there uh, a lot of times, this allows you to Kind of squeeze down that redundancy and balance um, the, um, the, the contribution of different sequences. Typically, if you set this to let's say 80%, which is our default, you're good to go. The only case where you need to change this if you're running very conserved protein families. So examples for that would be viral proteins or highly conserved eukaryotic proteins. Um, for bacterial proteins or divergent eukaryotic families such as GPCRs, um, there is no need to adjust this parameter. Okay, so um, these were the most important parameters and now we're getting to the part where we're looking at the actual results. And um, as I just said, it's a priori often not clear what a good sequence alignment depth is. Um, a sequence alignment that contains sequences that have the same structure or function. So we run all these different sequence alignments. Here you see um, four lines for the four different bit score thresholds that were run. And you get graphical summaries on the web server and you get this in tabular form for the application too, um, summarizing what these sequence alignments look like. And um, there is two fundamental goals here, and they're um, at a, you need to trade off between the two in many cases. And there is, again, no clear-cut right answer. It depends on, on what you're interested in. So the first target variable is the alignment coverage of the target, which you see with these bar plots on the, on the left-hand side. Um, the question here is, which regions of your target sequence could you actually generate a confident alignment for 
with a few gaps. So let's say loop regions or um, other uh, variable parts don't align well, whereas the conserved parts of the structure or of the sequences would, um, would align well across the entire family. And um, so you can see here what parts of your uh, sequence of interest um, have good alignment coverage. Um, the closer you get to your target sequence, typically um, the better the alignment coverage gets because the sequence are, um, are closer in sequence space and, and um, haven't diverged as far. So it's always a question here, are the relevant bits that you're interested in covered by your sequence alignment? The second property that's interesting is, which you see on the, on the right hand side, is the number of sequences. So the further you go out in sequence space, um, the lower your bit score threshold is, typically the more sequences you fetch. And having a sufficient amount of sequence diversity is really a prerequis prerequisite for the method to work properly. Um, but then, and here's the trade-off, as you go out further, you may lose good alignment coverage of uh, your target sequence. So um, the goal is to find this sweet spot where you still have good coverage of your target sequence with your alignment, but you also still have enough sequences um, to infer a good probability model of the sequences. And again, having a lot of the, um, diversity in the alignment helps you. And one measure for that is um, what's called sequences over L, um, which is just the number of redundancy reduced sequences. So you clustering based on the thresholds outlined on the previous slide, divided by the length of your target sequence. And the rule of thumb is um, you typically want at least five uh, sequence, effective sequences per residue for the, um, for the uh, probability model to work properly. Now, because this trade-off is always very subjective and it's been something that's been plaguing us for years actually, um, because it's not very comfortable for users, um, we developed something new and that's um, in beta testing on the web server and also in our um, pipeline. And uh, we'll also make sure to have this on SP Grid uh, very soon, um, is a little machine learning tool that helps you select what is probably um, a good alignment to look at. And um, that little machine learning tool for each of the alignments outputs a quality score between zero and 10. And you also get these traffic light colors and um, 10 meaning it's, it's a good set of ECs um, that look reliable where and zero means it's a bad set of ECs um, that's not reliable. And then you also get a little star next to the uh, alignment here at 0.3 bit square threshold, which means um, that is the alignments um, EV couplings automatically recommends to you. Uh, because it has the highest quality score. And you see it's uh, kind of midway in terms of coverage. It covers more of the target sequence than 0.1. Um, but at the same time, it still has a lot more sequences than um, the alignments at 0.5 or 0.7. So that's a good alignment to start exploring. But of course, the 0.1 alignment here, which also has a good quality score, is also worth having a look at. It's just a, a first indication what results this is worth exploring first. Okay, and now we're looking at the um, results from one of the alignment thresholds. So you will get this set of predictions for each of the alignments uh, that you ran and the set of ev evolutionary couplings that you inferred. And what you see on this slide is now the visualization from the, from the web server, which are interactive plots because it's a React-based web application, um, but you will get the same outputs in static form from the command line application. So. The, the basic um, or the most fundamental prediction that you will get from EV couplings is the set of residue pairs um, that show strong evolutionary co-conservation uh, co based on this probability model that we infer. Um, in the pipeline, this is in an output file called coupling scores.csv, which is a sorted table of residue pairs starting with the most strongly coupled pairs and then going down. And uh, for each of these pairs, you will get a score um, that tells you how strong that coupling is. And you will also get a probability um, how likely it is that this pair is actually corresponding to a true coupled residue pair 
for example, due to being a residue-residue contact in 3D. Um, there is also additional versions of this coupling scores.csv file um, called coupling scores compared, which um, then contains additional columns um, based on comparison to known 3D structures. So you right away get the um, distances and angstroms in 3D structures and also um, uh, evaluation using the pr uh, positive predictive value, how accurate these ECs are as predictors of residue residue contacts at a given um, distance threshold in 3D. Um, what you'll also get is um, what you see on the left-hand side, the plots we've already seen briefly before uh, that Kelly explained, uh, which are these contact map representations where we overlay um, the evolutionary couplings uh, on this 2D plot, where each axis is um, the primary sequence, and um, the ECs are shown in black. And um, then if there are homologous 3D structures, the uh, application automatically uh, extracts residue-residue contacts from these and shows them on the contact map plots uh, as blue uh, as blue dots. And then if the black is on the blue, that means the EC is a predictor of residue-residue proximity. Um, <clears throat> on the web server, you can right away explore um, both the residue contacts and the um, evolutionary couplings in the context of known and predicted 3D structures. Um, in a 3D viewer, we're using the NGL viewer from uh, RCSB here. Um, in the pipeline, uh, you will get uh, PyMol uh, scripts that allow you to, for instance, paint the evolutionary couplings onto 3D structures. Um, one of the key aspects that we predict, for starting from the evolutionary couplings, are then predicted 3D structures. Um, these are also outputs by the pipeline in a subdirectory called fold. And there will be just a bunch of PDB files corresponding to all the structural models that the application created for you. And then there is also tables comparing to known structures. And there's also a table um, that gives a blind ranking and clustering results for the predicted structures that allow you to gauge uh, how good these predictions are blindly. But um, these contact maps evaluated against known structures is only part uh, of, of uh, what you can see. There's a lot of value that um, go beyond pure structure predictions. For instance, with EC pairs that do not correspond to known 3D structure contacts. So here again, you see ECs overlaid onto a known structure. And you see there are some uh, black dots that do not overlay blue dots, but they're suspiciously, suspiciously close um, to experimental structure contacts, like the one circled in red here. And um, this is one of the cases where ECs can really add a lot on top uh, of known structures, even if those are known, uh, in identifying, let's say, alternative confirmations. Let's say you have a transporter and you know one confirmation, but you don't know what the other confirmation looks like, ECs can help you what does that other confirmation look like and what residues are in contact in that other confirmation. Or um, if the monomer structure is part of a multimer, um, ECs can also help you to sort out what the multimerization pattern is, what are the self-self the interactions between different monomeric subunits of the same protein. So there's a lot of new biology that you can learn about. Um, there is also a different way to look at these ECs, um, which is shown here. Now going just from pairs back to the residue level and asking for each residue, um, how strongly is it coupled to its neighbors, to, uh, to its neighbors uh, in basically laying this out as a residue network. And what this can help you to identify is residues that are really functionally important, such as active sites or uh, elastary networks, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, by exploring ECs and how strongly coupled residues are, if you don't know what the active site is, let's say you can, you can get a first hint um, what that protein does by just looking at, at these residues. And again, the web server um, allows you to visualize that both as an interactive cytoscape JS network, you get a residue table where you can click through all these residues and at the same time you get them highlighted in known or predicted 3D structures using the structure viewer panel. 
in the pipeline application, um, you get a table and again, PyMOL scripts that allow you to extract the same information and, and to visualize um, all these, these things yourself. And uh, going beyond structure, um, we've already seen this in Kelly's introduction, EV couplings um, using this probability model of the sequences allows you also to um, predict mutation effects uh, for any mutation to the target sequence. And all these outputs for the pipeline are uh, in the subdirectory called mutate. And there is uh, plots and tables that outline in, um, the single substitutions. So it's basically an in silico uh, mutation scan uh, of the entire sequence um, to all 20 possible substitutions or all 19 possible substitutions in each position. At the same time, um, this probability model is not limited to just predicting single mutations, but you can also predict any higher order mutation um, using the model parameter file that the application generates for you. And by inputting a um, CSV file that contains higher order mutations or using the Python package, and um, then you can also predict, let's say, all double mutants or all triple mutants if you're interested in that. On the web server, again, you get an interactive uh, visualization where you can explore um, the, the effects, both painted onto 3D structures, predicted and experimental, and uh, as a matrix visualization um, that's seen on the left-hand side here. And you, again, get these plots in static form and also as interactive HTML plots in, from the standalone application. And um, here's a view that's, um, again, on the web server, you have all that information in the pipeline as well. Uh, you get a um, set of predicted three-dimensional structures. And uh, on the web server, you can uh, very quickly compare these predictions to known experimental structures. Um, but again, if you prefer to do this offline, uh, you can also use your favorite 3D structure viewer and drag in the PDB structures and PyMOL scripts that we provide for that. Now, um, this presentation, this seminar was really just an introduction to the most important aspects of EV couplings. Uh, on our GitHub repository, um, we have a whole set of uh, tutorials um, that show you how to run EV couplings pipeline jobs how to um, change the configuration files. Um, the URL is at the bottom uh, of the slide. Um, so all the most important aspects are covered there and uh, you can just work through this um, uh, yourself. And if you have any questions, drop us an email anytime at support at evcouplings.org and we'll try to help you as good as we can um, in, in trying to get your jobs up and running. Um, so you can make useful predictions. And again, at this point, I should mention, uh, because we're pointing to the GitHub repository, um, this is also a quite useful Python package um, that you can use for developing your own Python code. Now here's um, the, at this point, not so small list of uh, papers and resources that you can explore if uh, this uh, sparked your interest. So uh, we have quite a, few papers, but now on this method, starting with a original publication in 2011 that established EV couplings as a method for uh, structure prediction. Um, and then uh, we followed up on that work with lots of different aspects, um, such as membrane structure predictions, uh, protein and protein interaction predictions, mutation effect predictions, RNA structure predictions. So this method is also applicable to RNA or protein RNA interactions. Um, conformational changes, and also hybrid methods for integrating ECs with experimental data, um, such as hybrid NMR EC-based approaches, molecular replacement, um, or also combining um, data from experimental evolution, so artificially generating sequences in the lab and then inferring um, 3D structure from artificially generated sequences in the lab. Um, so we've already seen the a uh, link to our GitHub page, uh, which also has the tutorials. Um, the installation instructions, thanks to SP Grid, are not relevant for you as much. Uh, we have then uh, our main webpage, evcouplings.org, 
um, where you find all these resources bundled together and um, the web server as it's in use currently. And um, then there is the exclusive link to our beta test of the new web server. So all the visualizations that you've seen today are from, from this page, evcouplings.2.hms.harvard.edu. Um, there's also the uh, lab website of Debbie Marks at HMS. And again, uh, if you have any questions, drop us an email anytime at support at evcouplings.org. Uh, all of us are reading these emails and uh, we'll try to give you helpful feedback and answers. And uh, with that, we've reached the end of this webinar. Um, there's a lot of other people who contributed to this outlined on this slide uh, in Debbie's lab, uh, in Chris Sanders lab, at HMS Cell Biology, and Dana Farber. And at this uh, uh, point, also a big thank you to HMS Research Computing, in particular, Doug Feldman and Amir Karga, uh, who helped us a lot in uh, getting all of the software and web servers up and running. And uh, so now we've reached the end of this presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, we're very happy to answer them. Thanks, Thomas and Kelly. That was, that was a great presentation. And there are, there are many questions. <laughs> so I, I guess what, one to start off with is, can you say a little bit about the computational requirements? You know, is this something, could you run this on a workstation? Do you need a cluster? Do you need cloud computing? You can definitely run it on your own personal laptop. Uh, the only kind of tricky bit is that sometimes the alignments do take some amount of time and memory to run. Um, so in that case, uh, like we usually run them on O2, but it is possible to run them on a workstation. Okay. Um, so just to, to um, make this uh, even, even more uh, drastic, the, the first predictions for the first 2011 paper were actually done on a MacBook Air. So oh. it's definitely runnable on, uh, on, on a regular computer. But of course, it does take a while, especially the sequence alignment generation. Um, so if you have access to a cluster um, and you want to run large amounts of jobs, it's definitely advisable to go to the cluster, I would say. I guess a follow up on that is it, it uses, it checks various sequence databases. Is that something that you can point it to a local copy of a sequence database or does that need us? Um, so the um, sequence database um, needs to be local actually for the search. So the, the sequence alignment tool we are mainly using is Jackhammer from, from Sean Eddy's lab. And you just need to have a local copy of the fast A file on your machine uh, where you're running EV couplings. Right, so if you have a particular data set that you want to search against, for example, if you wanted to look at metagenomics data for very particular applications, then you can download it from Magnify and query against it directly. It can be any fast A file. Yeah. Um, that's the only requirement. Thank you. Um, another question. So if, if you have, have a protein where it's a, a proenzyme that gets cleaved into, you know, Let's say you have a relatively large domain that's cleaved into two smaller domains that are held together by disulfides. Is that something that you could accommodate with EV couplings analysis? I think that it could definitely come out, yes. Um, so we have had good results looking at interdomain contacts before. Um, I actually have a student working right now on getting the exact values for how well we can do on those. But for sure, we've definitely seen cases where we've had good contacts between two domains, especially where that particular architecture is conserved. And we can see that signal in the alignments. But it's very much dependent on what exactly the protein is that you're looking at and sort of its evolutionary history. OK, thank you. Well, the, the basic rule of thumb is um, if you can get a good sequence alignment, um, most likely it will work. If you can't construct the sequence alignment automatically, um, it's always worth checking uh, if you can, by some manual intervention, uh, create that sequence alignment. For instance, by aligning both domains separately and then stitching the sequences back together. If, yeah. if, if you have a sequence alignment that you have managed to get working, is that something where you could provide it as an input? Yes. yes. Um, so that's uh, also an option that you can specify either through the command line application with a flag or um, using the config file. Um, you can just input any sequence alignments 
uh, if it's in the right uh, format, which is an aligned fast A format um, that distinguishes between aligned and non-aligned residues, um, you can input any alignment that you want. Uh, on the web server at the moment, you can't do that. So that's a feature that's exclusive as of now to um, uh, the command line application. And we're working on getting this into the web server too, eventually. There, there have been a, a couple of questions about comparisons to, to other methods that people have been familiar with. Uh, so can you, can you say anything about comparisons to uh, Molprobity, Gremlin from Baker's Lab? Uh, there was one more I'm digging through the list to make sure I have the name right. Uh, Fire2 and Swiss AA prot. Um, so, uh, this I is kind of a zoo of comparison questions yeah. rolling into one. Yeah. So the, the closest, the closest cousin to this, uh, surely is Gremlin, um, which was published, I think two years. So the, the, the model um, the probability model, they had that published very, very early around, I think 2010. And, um, then I think they, they published a piece on structure prediction using a very similar uh, probability model about two years after our initial paper. Um, so the, the methods are uh, very similar in terms of how you get the, the, the couplings between residue pairs. Um, then there's differences in the structure predictions. So we use CNS for, for our structure predictions, uh, which is very fast. Um, so you get the predictions, let's say a minute or two per model. Um, so it's much, much quicker to run than uh, Rosetta. So if you want to have a first dash, um, that's, that's certainly an advantage of using CNS. And just to kind of, yeah, just to kind of add on to that a little bit, a lot of times our CNS models, even though they are much faster to generate, tend to be very good. Like we've seen TM scores up to like 0.8 for some of our models. And some of them are sufficient to use for molecular replacement and crystallography. So even though we're using a faster folding method, it can still produce very good results. Great. And so now we have uh, Jason has a hand raised, so I will unmute Jason and let him ask his question. So Jason, go ahead. Thanks. I've got two short questions. One, is there anything special about amino acids in this program? Or if I wanted to use it on, let's say, morphological characters evolving over time, could I fake code them as amino acids because the program doesn't know that there's a difference between lysine and alanine? The yeah. second question I want to ask is, uh, sometimes trees are weirdly shaped. You can have long branches, you can have a lot of sampling in one clade and not another clade. So uh, what are some ways, what are some things that could go wrong there and what are some ways you would deal with that? Thank you. Both very good questions. Um, so the first question, uh, the answer is yes. Um, the model as such doesn't know anything about proteins. Um, it's, it's a very generic probabilistic model. Um, that's also come up, um, originally came up in physics as a POTS model. So the, um, the statistical physics uh, language, um, this is inverse POTS inference. Um, in graphical model speak, this is, is inference of undirected graphical models. Um, so you could, in principle, put any, uh, any sort of, of coding in there. Um, there are some hyperparameters that you may need to optimize for your uh, application of interest. Um, just with regards to regularization of the problem. Um, but other than that, it's completely generic. So it can also ha handle R more biologically, in, um, more, or talking more about biology, it can handle RNA just as well as, as proteins, and you could put anything in there. Um, then to your uh, second question. Um, Kelly, do you want to? Oh, sure. So the question was about um, exactly how the phylogeny affects. Um, so I wasn't a part of this analysis, but there was actually an early um, research question in the lab about exactly that point. Like, how do phylogenies inter? How do phylogenies particular to a particular family um, affect the results? And what we saw is that it was actually somewhat robust um, to what your tree looks like. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a deeper point I can make here. Um, 
because we are sort of handling that already in the theta downweighting of redundant sequences. So that's implicitly um, being addressed. So we think that that's why we didn't really see any results when we tried to do anything more complicated in terms of getting the phylogeny squared away because we are sort of implicitly accounting for that by downweighting sequences that are almost redundant with each other or too close to each other. Um, yeah, so the, 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 that sums it up very nicely. <laughs> uh, the, a very basic approach using this down weighting um, fares from what we've seen just as well as, as more elaborate approaches. So someone in the lab has developed a method that actually does the statistical inference on a phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree, um, which was a lot more complicated as an inference method. Um, but then in the end, uh, when, when you looked at the results, um, the, let's say ECs weren't any better as a predictor of um, structural contacts or mutation effects. Yeah. So it seems remarkably robust um, to that aspect. Uh, so there, I apologize if this is something you've already addressed, but is there is there an approach that's different if you're looking at a, a heterodimer or a complex with multiple different subunits and how to accommodate doing EV couplings through that? Right, so I think so just to um, rephrase that you're asking about the difference between looking at hetero multimers where you have different sequences that are interacting with each other versus homo multimerization, for example, where you have multiple copies of the same sequence interacting. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. Like the coupling would be essentially between two different sequences. Right. So in that case, um, that's more similar to, so what you would use for that is our complex part of the pipeline, where you can actually put in two sequence, two very different sequences, we build the alignments for them, and we actually stitch the alignments together where they're found in the same species, and then you can do the exact same uh, mathematical analysis on them. So that was be what you would use for heteromultimerization. You would use the what we would call the um, complex uh, protocol in the pipeline. If you're more interested in homomultimers, on the other hand, in that one, you would usually what we would usually do is we would run just the monomer by itself. And this also applies for sequences that are essentially paralogs of each other. So if you have two sequences, both in the same species, but that are very, very close to each other are paralogs, you would also do something similar for this case, where you would actually look at the monomers. And if you have a known structure of just the monomer, you could compare it against that. And again, we're sort of looking for those false positives. Things that say, if you remember from our contact maps, mm -hmm. let's see if I can pull up. Where you're sort of looking for these things that don't match the no monomer structure but are clustered together in such a way that it gives you more confidence that they are picking up on something that's biologically relevant. So usually when we see things like this that are sort of clustered together, our first two thoughts automatically are it's either an alternative structure, a different confirmation, or it's a homomultimer. So that would be one way. So we're actively working on how to distinguish between those two cases. So stay tuned in that area. Um, but they are uh, related but different use cases. So you just have to remember complex if it's two different sequences that you want the interaction between. So for example, that would be like the two antibiotic resistance proteins, RADA and PPP2 that we talked about earlier. Or if you wanted to look at homomultimization or close paralogs, you would do something like this, looking for these contexts that are not consistent with the known monomeric structure. Great. And that, that actually transitions to another question, which is how, how is the, the case where your correlated residues are in an unstructured region? Like, how does that show up in terms of visualization or is that, is, how is that meaningful? There is a paper that deals with exactly that, the uh, Prichorchen et al. Uh, from 2016, which looks at um, disordered parts uh, of proteins um, specifically. So actually, I might try to pull up the... <clears throat> so in principle, the approach is, is completely uh, applicable to um, disordered proteins. The main problem there is um, whether you can get a good sequence alignment, because um, disordered regions tend to be very hard to, to align. 
and if you can't align them properly, then of course it's it's difficult. But then there is actually different types of machine learning models that may be better suited. Um, and there has been work in Debbie's lab on working on alignment-free methods um, that can help you um, with, with that. But it's, it's certainly worth a shot um, uh, and to try and run it and, and see if you can get something. Yeah. And then I, I believe this is our last question. So it is, have you folks looked at the benefit of considering more than just pairs when you're doing coupling? Like a, increasing it to you know higher dimensional space. Right. So we have definitely thought about this and looked at it as well. Um, the trick is that the underlying mathematics become a lot more complex the higher order you go. Um, so we're actually using. So there's been um, more recent work in the lab that's actually trying to more take into account those things, but it's actually using a new framework that's more similar to um, natural learning or natural language processing methods. Uh, so if you're interested in those methods, I would suggest you check out some of the other publications on the Marks Lab website. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, it's, we definitely would love to be able to handle higher order terms, but it does become sort of intractable. So that's why we're coming up with, that's why we've been looking at new frameworks for how to incorporate that into our results. So yeah. some people have, have actually looked, um, let's say triplets, um, instead of just pairs. Um, and for, for it being a lot more complex, a lot more parameters, which means you need more sequences, more data, uh, which is often the limiting factor here. Um, even for the cases where you could do triplets um, because you had enough data, um, it's really diminishing returns. And um, there was not a lot that you gained on top of using pairs. Yeah, great point. But in most cases, pairs actually should be um, giving you a lot of, of good and relevant information already. Great. Well, that's the, the last of the questions, unless I've missed any, which if, if I have, this is your last moment. But thanks, uh, Kelly and Thomas. Thank you for presenting. That was, that was a great talk. I actually ran out of my scrap paper when I was taking notes on it. <laughs> so thank you for presenting. And Everybody in the audience, thank you for joining in. Uh, hope we see you in future sessions. And thank you to SB Grid for hosting us. <laughs> We're happy to have you folks.